Connor, have you ever heard the phrase, put it on ice when you want to preserve a topic, but come back to it? Are you going to tell me, like, we should talk later? (laughs) Well, let's talk now. But we're going to talk about putting things on ice in the literal sense. Cryopreservation of biologics to overcome challenges of safe drug delivery for CAR T therapy. And our guest is the illustrious scientist, John Morris. Ah, so this is the fellow from our most recent Pioneers and Visionaries docu-series. Correct. And anyone want to guess where you can find a link to that series? I do, I do. I'm going to guess. Is it in the show notes? Bing, 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 bing. Correct. Yay. Okay, so real podcast, real show notes. So pioneering and visionary science must be what matters on today's episode of Discovery Matters. So I came to Cambridge as a postdoctoral student in the mid-1970s and I worked on very exciting work on freezing of T cells, mainly for diagnostic uses, immunological sort of applications. You know, this was predated CAR-T by many, many years and we published high-profile papers which were generally ignored until five or ten years ago. But it was a very exciting time to work in freezing. You are hearing now the voice of John Morris, PhD, former CEO of Asymptote, which was acquired by Cytiva. And then John still consults with us. To John, Cambridge is where cryopreservation was invented. There was a community of people who understood about freezing. So it was a very, very exciting time. So I worked on freezing of cells. But why cryopreservation? Why did this spark John's interest? I just got very, very interested in freezing, trying to understand what happens during freezing, what happens to the cells during that freezing process. I was offered a PhD from the Medical Research Council. They had an institute where um, they were interested in freezing cells for medical applications which were of interest at that time. So it was freezing blood cells, platelets, lymphocytes. Well, as he mentioned earlier, during his PhD, they published around four papers in Nature, one of the most eminent scientific journals. And they published this paper on freezing T cells these papers are still being cited because of how important it is in relation to CAR T cells. Okay, but by the sounds of it, he didn't go straight from working on his PhD to his work related to CAR T cells, right? Right, right, right. John and his colleagues got some venture capital money. They formed a company working on freezing problems, but there wasn't a lot of commercial freezing of cells at the time. So they worked on things like ice cream, Yum. Frozen foods, frozen cocktails, freeze-drying petrochemicals. So these are all industries where you're forming or controlling how ice forms. And as a side note, John is exceptionally good at making ice cream. I'm very good at making ice cream. I understand how to control the crystal growth and the nucleation of ice cream. I love this. The serendipity of application of knowledge from one industry to another, from ice cream to tea cells. But I guess ice cream's not John's major calling, right? What happened in the early 2000s was that cell and gene therapy came along. And the UK government put a lot of money into supporting that embryonic industry. So they formed things like a catapult, but they also put a lot of grant money into the area. And one of the steps that they identified as being key was how do you get the cell and gene therapy from the manufacturer into a patient? So gradually this new industry started to form. These big funding firms decided it was going to be a big opportunity for the UK economy. And then they realized that the delivery of samples from a manufacturer to a patient was a problem that needed solving. A number of examples where people had done clinical trials with new products had failed because we didn't manage to control getting the material to a patient. And that was like a known challenge at the time. People were trying their best to freeze properly, as it were. And if they could, it would allow safer delivery of products, I suppose. When we exposed it to the people in cell and gene therapy, it was disruptive. You know, it was something they hadn't heard of. 
cells had to be frozen in a new way because in CAR-T therapy, the cells are taken from the patient, then manipulated, then grown up and put back into the same patient. So this is what we know as autologous cell therapy. You put the cells back into the patient that they came from. And so if you put cells back into the wrong patient, first of all, you'd lose the cells, which are a therapy for somebody else. And secondly, your patient could be even more ill. Mm, Exactly. And this is where John's expertise really came in. The CAR-T workflow at the moment is that you take cells from a patient, you freeze them, you ship them to a manufacturer, the manufacturer grows the CAR-Ts up, they then freeze them, ship them back to a patient. And this can be in different continents. And it's critical to be able to just ensure that the right cells are coming back and there's no mixing up. And we've been instrumental in you know, developing a cold chain with equipment and software so that we can ensure the sample's followed at every stage. And also that the sample is, you can check it's been frozen correctly. Also, you can check that it's been thawed correctly and stored correctly. This ensures that the patient is going to get the best quality material for treatment. So there was a need for cryopreservation to help scale up. And John's vision exactly when he set out to create a cryogenic cold chain, doesn't that just sound cool? Absolutely. I work in cryogenic cold chains. Cold chains. That's a real conversation starter in the pub, isn't it? What was his vision when he set out creating these? The vision was basically to be able to just digitally track, you know, the sample from the patient right the way through the manufacturing process and back into the patient and to know it was optimum for treatment. And if we look back now at all that's been achieved and all of John's contributions, they've been absolutely foundational here. If it weren't for the cryo cold chain, then the potential of CAR-T therapy may not have happened for Oh, another 10 years. Imagine all the patients. Exactly. There's many companies in the world now manufacturing CAR-T therapies and they've been applied to tens of thousands of patients with very, very good success, especially if you know, they've administered to patients who failed many of the treatments. So in the long term, they might even be frontline treatments. John mentioned that it was a multidisciplinary beginning for him with lots of colleagues from engineering and different sciences. How was the cryo cold chain then influenced by his collaboration? Well, the team was small to begin with, eight people, and they encountered a common problem for companies of that size. We were manufacturing the equipment and doing everything. And we had a lot of interest from the major people in cell and gene therapy but we had commercial problems about getting them to take the product on because we were too small a company to sort of support it, in their view. Because of their small size, they would struggle to manufacture the sheer quantities of the product required. Without the infrastructure, they just couldn't scale up. All that changed when they were acquired. We wanted to get it out to the world in a bigger way. Yeah. And we couldn't really do it on our own that easily. So we did need to get some sort of backing, yeah. But it always felt like we were in the right place, that the industry was growing quickly. There was a need for cryopreservation to help the scale up. Yeah. These new voices are Chris Creasy, Hardware Engineering Operations Manager, and Stephen Lamb, Manager of the Cryo Chain Mechanical Engineering, both of whom are colleagues of ours at Cytiva. And they were with John throughout this whole time. All that hard work up to the acquisition, that felt like the, the real hard work in the acquisition was the finish line. Yeah, it wasn't quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Couldn't have been further from the truth, was it? It really started after that point. This is what always fascinates me. You know, you've got this amazing science, and then in a situation like this, you've got this drive which is shared by a team because a patient, a person, is waiting. Sometimes when we were dealing with companies, you didn't always see the doctors or the patients, but occasionally, I remember one company in Holland, that was a university hospital. Yeah. And when you walk through the hospital and the cancer wards to get to their premises and mm. the guy saying, they're the patients, yeah. and that's quite sobering. Understandably, John is really proud of his contributions to human health. We're not responsible for the whole process, but our equipment's used for saving lives. How does that make you feel? Very happy. It's being used for a lot of CAR-T therapies, so it's, you know, makes you feel very good. In the future, the developments are all about 
dry cells. From a preservation point of view, in the long term, potentially if you could move away from liquid nitrogen temperatures to store material, if you could dry cells or have other ways of stabilising cells, that would completely revolutionise what, what happens in cell and gene therapy. If it was like a magic way of just stabilising them so that they could be transported and not die or could be stored for a period. So we've looked back 20 years today. What does John see 20 years in the future? The other like dream is at the moment, cell and gene therapy is very good with blood cancers. Blood cancers are only 10% of all cancer deaths. So it's solid tumours, you know, lung cancer, liver. The dream is that in the long term, those will be treated by cell and gene therapies. And there are many, many people working on those, but it's not as well developed as the blood cancers. So that's a topic that is not put on ice, but is about properly putting cells on ice. Do you like how we came full circle? That was deeply... <laughs> was that painful? ...delicately and so <laughs> carefully crafted. I would just say, you've got it down to an art. Okay. Amazing puns aside, bringing us full circle. <laughs> uh, what have you learned this week that and no puns allowed, has opened your eyes a bit. This is another podcast, and there's a reason that this podcast is, you know, so popular. It's called This American Life, and the episode is called The Feather Heist. And it's just so beautifully put together. It is about rare feathers being used as fishing lures. And it, I mean, it's just a great story. I don't want to spoil it. I recommend that you go listen to the episode of This American Life. It sent me down a rabbit hole of let's explore rare bird feathers and their value and why we human beings are interested in them. And just a, a small little factoid here, the most expensive feather ever fetched 4,000 pounds at an auction and it came from the extinct Huya bird from New Zealand. Who would have known that that would ever have been a sentence? The most expensive feather ever. <laughs> Huya would have known. Did you? I did. I slipped into a pun. Did you hear that there? Shall I repeat oh, it? This is just terrible. Huya would have we known. We can't do this. <laughs> and yet we did. Public service announcement. We have to apologize. <laughs> All right. I dare you to bring a pun into what you learned now, Connor. <laughs> so from extinct birds to perhaps and maybe inspired by the book that you and Lars gave me, Overstory, by Richard Powers. Mm, love the Overstory. Absolutely marvellous book about the impact of trees on human stories. There is a study out by Ohio State University which has showed that the forest growing season in the United States has increased by a month. So the growing period of hardwood trees in the east of the northern United States has gone up by, on average, one month over the last hundred years as temperatures have risen. So these trees burst into bud earlier, their leaves fall in the autumn later. And this is showing the impact of climate change on how our forests work. Yeah. I'll let you judge whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to have trees growing for longer. Or slowly. Or more slowly. But there you go. We're really seeing it in, and in centuries time, people will see it in the rings of the trees. Well, you didn't bring us a pun, so I'm just going to say, Connor, you could knock me over with a feather. Oh. With that fact. God, that's. Come on. Next time I want you to bring your pun I, game. Okay, I'm just going to say insert hilarious tree joke right here and let's bring this to an end. Our producer is Beth Armit Brewster. Who blooms? <laughs> blooms in her role. <laughs> Editing, mixing and supervision by Ulrika Svensson and Tom Henley from Banda Productions. Music from Epidemic Sound. My name is Connor McKechnie. And mine is Dodie Axelson. Please do rate us on Spotify or whichever platform you use to listen to our podcast. We will catch you audibly when we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters. Discovery Matters.